Guten Abend. Welcome in the Dripping Institute. My name is uh, Rico Fritzig. I'm here the director. <coughs> yeah, welcome, welcome. Uh, that is now all in the Netherlands. We can do better in it uh, Engels. That is uh, still a bit easier. Can I have a few questions? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I do not live. I do not have a problem. It helps a lot. Also, Vorsicht, let off. Um, I'm really happy to have tonight here Gabbis, Garrett Stedman Jones and Marcel Marius van der Linden. Marius is very important, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Marius van der Linden. Marcel, we, we leave Marcel, just we, we skip mm. it. Okay, Marius van der Linden. <laughs> and uh, we are, they are having a talk about a book uh, Garrett Stedman Jones has written. He is, as you all know, a renowned British academic and historian and author. And at the moment, if I got it right, he's a professor, and it's, that's why I wrote it down, professor of, the, professor of the history of ideas, which is such a nice expression, history of ideas at the Queen Mary University of London. And Marius van der Linden, Marius, you probably all know, he was the director of research at the International Institute of Social History here in Amsterdam and is still active as a senior researcher there and also holds a professorship dedicated to the history of social movements at the University of Amsterdam. And that's all I will say. I just wish you a really nice evening and I give my word or the word to Marius. Yeah. Um, and if you allow, I will call myself Marcel from now on again. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I, I should skip Marius and then I, I, yeah, I stick the, to Yeah, that was the intention, yes. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> Marius, this is, I, I, this will, will never happen again. What's the first no, time we meet, so it's, yeah, maybe excuse true. me. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so our guest tonight is Gareth Stephen Jones. And uh, Mirko already said a few things about you, uh, Gareth, but let me say some more things. You did your doctorate in Oxford in 1970, and for the Goethe connection, it is important to know that you were a fellow of the Alexander Humboldt uh, Stiftung in the Department of Philosophy at the Goethe University in Frankfurt in 73 74. Uh, later, you became consecutively lecturer, reader, and professor in Cambridge until you joined the University of London as professor of history of ideas in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. From 64 to 81, you also served on the editorial board of the New Left Review, uh, and you were a joint founder of the History Workshop Journal in 1976, and you're still on the editorial board of that journal. Gareth has published some influential books. Uh, path-breaking and very important was his book, Outcast London, from 1971, the revised version of the PhD thesis. <coughs> Uh, which was republished three times and is a pioneering work on uh, the history of the laboring poor in uh, uh, London in the 19th century. Very controversial was the collection he published uh, in 1983, Languages of Class, Studies in English Working Class History, 1832 to 1982, uh, also published in German as Klassenpolitik Sprache, edited by Peter Schettler. And now we have the big uh, biography, Karl Marx, Greatness and Illusion, published in 2016. Uh, German translation appeared last year, and there seems to be a Dutch translation, but nobody of us here has seen it. Um, <laughs> the rest of the program uh, is as follows. First, Gareth will give a brief talk of about 15, maybe 20 minutes, uh, in which he will uh, present some of his key uh, results uh, on Karl Marx. Then he and I will have a conversation for another 40 minutes or so, and then the floor is open for all kinds of questions, criticisms, remarks, and so from your side. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, yes, what I want to do is, to begin with, is just highlight well, three ideas of which I think uh, Marx still deserves some sort of consideration. Um, in order to do that, um, 
first of all, and, and that's what my book is trying to do, is separate Marx from Marxism. Um, uh, the popular idea of Marx still associates him with determinist view of history, historical materialism, so-called scientific socialism. These were creations, by and large, of his friend Engels, um, and uh, they were not ideas, I would argue, that inspired Marx himself. So what I want to do is, as I say, uh, highlight a few ideas which I think um, uh, were important and still have some resonance today. And the first one I want to talk about really is the uh, conception uh, the, of socialism that Marx developed in the 1840s. Um, and what I want to argue here uh, against Engels and the later Marxist tradition is that the strength of Marx's position uh, developed from an appropriation of German idealism. Um, the importance of Marx's continuing affinity with idealism becomes clear when his approach is compared with that of other radicals and socialists at the time. Their outlook was shaped by a naturalistic version of materialism, standardly accepted by English thinkers from the time of Locke through to Bentham, prevalent among the philosophes and the ideologue in France, and shared among followers of Spinoza in Germany. Man was a natural being, his actions were motivated by the pursuit of happiness and the avoidance of pain. As a creature of nature, a sensuous being, man was primarily defined by his needs and his impulses. Throughout the 18th and early 19th century, that position was a welcome alternative to a Christian emphasis on original sin. It was also the position explicitly espoused by the largest socialist groupings in Europe in the 1840s, notably the followers of Robert Owen in England and of uh, Etienne Cavet in France. For them, again, man was a product of his environment, a consumer governed by his appetites and needs, and by improving this environment through better education, more enlightened attitude towards reward and punishment, it would be possible to transform human nature and increase the extent of human happiness. By contrast, Marx's innovation, spelled out in his writings, particularly in the course of 1844, but also afterwards, was to apply the insights of German idealism to the understanding of labour, to recuperate the emphasis found in idealism upon human activity and man's uh, 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 position as a producer. More striking, most striking here, was the connection made by Marx uh, between two areas of discourse which otherwise were unrelated to each other. Firstly, the social question and the plight of the proletariat, and secondly, the world transforming significance accorded to labour in Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit. By making that connection, Marx identified socialism with human self-activity as it had been invoked in the idealist tradition following the philosophical revolution accomplished by Kant. <coughs> Kant and Fichte had challenged the passivity of the image of man as a natural being, but it was in the phenomenology that Hegel, building upon the idealist inheritance, translated it into a vision of history. According to Marx, writing in 1844, Hegel had grasped the self-creation of man as a process and in doing so had grasped the essence of labour, the creation of man as the outcome of man's own labour. According to Marx, therefore, man was not nearly, merely a natural being, as other socialists argued, but, quote, a human natural being whose point of origin was not nature but history. Unlike animals, man made his activity, quote, the object of his will. Thus history could be seen as the humanisation of nature through man's conscious life activity. And it's from that idea about uh, the human energy and creativity involved in labour and activity uh, that you get uh, the memorable insights, I'd argue, in the Communist Manifesto, about the advances of the forces of production. By taking that step, Marx, more powerfully than anyone else in the 1840s, was able to invoke the unparalleled 
productive powers of modern industry. As he wrote in the Communist Manifesto, the bourgeoisie accomplished wonders far surpassing uh, e Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts and Gothic cathedrals. In 100 years it has created a more massive and colossal set of productive forces than have all the preceding generations put together. The second point I want to, I want to highlight relates to where did Marx's critique of political economy come from? I want to say it began as an offshoot of the young Hegelian critique of Christianity. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, Prussia turned its back on the reform era and asserted instead its identity as a Christian state. In this changed philosophical and political climate, Hegel's optimistic reason-based reconciliation between Christianity, the modern state and the modern economy became impossible to sustain. Between 1830 and 48, radical followers of Hegel, Strauss, Bruno Baum, Arnold Ruger, Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, in, in some of the young Hegelians, engaged in a process of fundamental historical and philosophical criticism of the biblical narrative and beyond that of religion itself. The most important, their most important conclusion, and I'm summarising very, very drastically here, associated with Ludwig Feuerbach, was that man projected his own power and creativity into God and presented himself as the creation of God. Man, Feuerbach's procedure was to reverse the equation. God did not create man, man created God. Subject and object are switched or inverted, and once that truth was recognised, the emancipation of man could proceed. The most distinctive features of Marx's uh, thinking about private property and capital were reached through this critique. Marx started as a, as a student of Bruno Bauer and moved to Feuerbach, and his innovation following Feuerbach was, uh, was that the, what, what Feuerbach had developed in relation to God could be applied to other abstractions, to the state, to the commodity form of economic exchange, and to human relations, human labour. And in our day, this form of critique, starting from inversion, could, I think, equally be applied to other forms of abstraction, for instance, neoliberalism, patriarchy, economic determinism, or climate change. In all these cases, such entities should be attributed to human agency rather than natural forces. And that theory could be enlarged by Amartya Sen's work, but I won't go into that now, given the shortage of time. Um, but that's the positive side of what his work in the 40s. I also want to sort of, uh, make, make criticism of the other use of Feuerbach that, that Marx and Engels made. Um, uh, that is the idea of species consciousness, which, uh, which um, Marx had gathered from Feuerbach. In this connection, Marx connect, congratulated Feuerbach, um, Marx congratulated Feuerbach in the summer of 1844 for providing, quote, the philosophical basis of socialism. The unity of man with man, he, he wrote, which is based on the real difference between men. The concept of human species brought down from heaven, the heaven of abstraction to the real earth. What is that but the concept of society? This obviously is a much more contestable claim. The genealogy of it goes back to David Strauss's Life of Jesus, published in 1835. Strauss claimed that if Christianity were to be saved for modern science, the figure of Christ would have to be replaced by the human species or the idea of humanity in the whole of its history. For only the infinite spirit of the human race could bring about the union of the finite and the infinite as portrayed by Hegel in, in his concept of absolute spirit. The next stage uh, beyond Strauss was really, uh, to cut the story short, taken by Feuerbach. Feuerbach replaced Hegel's idea of absolute spirit and Strauss's idea of the spiritual advance of the species by the notion, the more naturalistic notion, of what he called species being. 
whose expression would enable the flowering of man's communal nature. Species being was defined by Feuerbach as, quote, the unity of I and thou, i.e. not simply the relationship between man and woman, but more generally the fact that man was dependent upon other beings besides himself. Man was not pure spirit, uh, as, as Hegel uh, argued, or, or Bruno Bauer. Man's true human nature, man's huge human, na human nature, was an expression of the fact that he was both spiritual and natural being. But among the left Hegelians, awareness of man's true uh, species being had been blocked by the development of Christianity with its ascription of human agency to the divine. In place of recognition of man's communal character, there had developed the individualism of modern society and in Marx's extension of Feuerbach's approach in politics, the attribution of man's creative propensities to the agency of the modern state. In Marx's extension of the idea, uh, in 1844, man was subjected to the false reality of private property and political economy, just as in religion he was subjected to the false reality of God. The task of the critic was to restore man to a true consciousness of himself by uncovering the essential reality of species man buried beneath an inverted world. The difference between Marx's account of socialism and that found in France or England, or later Germany, was most marked in relation to the meaning attached to the proletariat. In France, the basic demand of French republicans or socialists was that the, republic, uh, was that the proletariat should be recognised as citizens and reunited with an undivided nature, nation, a demand which they achieved notionally in February 1848. In England, the position of the Chartists, with roots going back to John Locke's two treaties on government, and the 1689 settlement was that the working classes be fully recognised as part of the people, whose consent was necessary as the legitimate basis for any government. In Germany, on the other hand, in Marx's account, there was no historic appeal to a pre-existing or aboriginal constitution. Unlike the working classes in France or Britain, the proletariat were depicted by Marx as outside and beneath society defined by a vocation. As Marx explained in The Holy Family in 1844, it's not a question of what this or that proletarian, or even the whole proletariat, regards as its aim at the moment. It is a question of what the proletariat is, and what, in accordance with this being, it historically will be compelled to do. The identification of the proletariat with an image of human degradation uh, was powerfully reinforced by Engels' picture of the condition of the working class in England around the same time. In order to structure this depiction, Engels had drawn upon a communist reading of dehumanisation, identified with Hugh, uh, Moses Hess, and the contrast between egoism on the one hand and species consciousness on the other, found in the Deutsche Französische Jahrbuch. Guess, guess, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that the vocation, the idea of the proletariat having a vocation, really comes out of a theological debate. Um, it's not there, effectively, in uh, the French or the uh, British story, nor is it there later on. And the point about that um, uh, German approach in, in Marx is that it gets shattered in 1846 by Stirner's denunciation of Feuerbach, showing that this is a theological construction uh, which really can't be sustained. Okay, so, um, and it's in response to that that Marx um, uh, goes, reverts, or, or goes for an idea of class struggle as being just a description of what's happening in, in modernity, which again I think is very contestable the way he looks at it. Um, so, very briefly, uh, Marx tries in the 1840s to connect an idea of, of, of uh, revolution and the supersession of capitalism with um, the degradation of man and then overcoming of that degradation through revolt. Um, that, as I say, is um, punctured by the Stern account, but it's also 
um, really sort of demolished by what actually happens in 1848 where no such events occur. Just very briefly, in 1850s, I think he has the idea that capitalism is a system, it's um, an organic form, it will grow, come, and it's becoming more and more worldwide in the world market, but it's going to come to an ultimate crisis and collapse. 1857, 58 comes, no collapse, uh, not even uh, any political disruption. That's a period of, 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 of um, some form of neurosis, really, for Marx, because you know his, his theories are not coming true. 1860s, much better news. Uh, you get the development of the International Working Men's Association. Trade unions have found a form which is effective. Cooperatives are ex expanding. These are all in England, but to a certain extent elsewhere. Uh, and th there's pressure then for reform of the political system, culminating in the Second Reform Act. Um, now, the point about that is that Marx gets thoroughly involved in that and um, uh, calls it, salutes pressure from without, and I think that amounts to a different conception of revolution, which is more plausible, which is that revolution is not an event like the storming of the Winter Palace or the fall of the Bastille, it's a process. And it has a parallel in what Marx is saying in Capital about the transition from feudalism to capitalism, which goes over two centuries and so on. So I think that's an idea still worth entertaining. Um, so, um, well, we can talk more in discussion, but I think that would just uh, be enough for now. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, reading your biography of Karl Marx, I must say, was a real pleasure. It is uh, very well written. And yours is, the, I believe, the first Marx biography, which is partly at least based on the MEGA, the Marx Engels uh, Gesamtausgabe, which is still it's an ongoing publication project, which will be finished in 12 years' time. Um, 113 <laughs> volumes, because Marx was not lazy. <laughs> um, in the eyes of several reviewers, your approach is provocative, since uh, you treat Karl Marx as if he was an ordinary human being. Uh, of course, with important strengths, and you mentioned some just now, but also with quite a few weaknesses. As you say in your prologue, uh, the aim of this book is to put Marx back in his 19th century surroundings before all posthumous elaborations of his character and achievements were constructed. We may come back to that later. But first I would like to ask you a personal question. Um, Marx seems to have been with you since the early 1960s. Uh, when you were 21 or 22, you joined the editorial committee of the New Left Review. I already mentioned it. Uh, when the journal adopted a new format, and you collaborated with uh, well-known Marxists like Perry Anderson and Robin Blackburn and so on. And you stayed with the review until 81. Some of your publications from that time seem to foreshadow your current work. Uh, for example, an article you published in May 65, London and the Revolutionaries, on the first international, I don't know if you remember that uh, <laughs> <laughs> or things you wrote about Friedrich Engels. So at first you approached Marx from a Marxist per perspective and you firmly criticized people who took a different angle. For example, in 1972 you wrote a foreword to the English edition of Werner Blumenberg's, he's a colleague from my institute, passed away a long time ago, uh, of Werner Blumenberg's useful biography of Karl Marx. Here you criticize Blumenberg's social democratic interpretation, <laughs> complaining that for Blumenberg, Marx's importance, I quote you, Marx's importance today stems not from his creation of a new revolutionary theory, but the grandeur of his humanism and the wealth of insights scattered throughout his works. You were very much opposed to this uh, view. But then something happened. Uh, sometime in the 1970s, or perhaps early 80s, your approach changed. In 83, you published uh, the collection of essays, Languages of Class, in which you made a so-called linguistic term. Uh, for now, I only want to observe that since then, the early 80s, you have distanced yourself explicitly from Marxism, as you also did today, of course, uh, but you continue to think and write about Marx and his companion Friedrich Engels. Uh, uh, in 2002, you republished the Communist Manifesto together with an enormous introductory essay of some 180 pages. 
And recently, you published this big biography called Marx, Greatness and Illusion. Of course, you've done more than only studying Marx and Marxism. I mentioned your studies on, on property and so. But my question is, of course, why are you so fascinated by Marx that you uh, let him accompany you for about half a century? Um, well, part of it is accident, although that may sound odd. But um, when I was in the 60s, of course, I was from the left, and I was very um, much part of the sort of uh, new left outlook. Um, uh, I didn't know, although I admired much, I didn't know anything about him to speak of. Um, and I think my, the beginning of some sort of um, shift um, really was the result of it, of 1968. Because um, a standard sort of interpretation on, anyway, the more Trotsky uh, uh, influenced aspects of the British left was that um, 1968 meant, betokened some sort of um, uh, awakening of revolution again in Europe. Uh, I was very sceptical, but doubly sceptical because um, uh, I, I soon after uh, spent a year in Frankfurt, um, so I met a lot of the German SDS at the time, um, and what struck me was, you know, the immense difference of uh, conditions between the British and uh, the German left at that time. I mean, I felt very, my friends, I felt very sorry for them because, you know, they spoke about their uncle or their, you know, grandfather or whoever who, who was, who, whose image was fatally sort of um, compromised by collusion with Nazism and the rest of it. By contrast, obviously, whether by luck or good judgment, Britain was on the other side, so people could feel proud of their war record. So whatever was going to happen, um, I did, first of all, I didn't think that um, uh, the, the German left's interpretation that this was all a, a problem about capitalism was sufficient. And secondly, I thought that in, in Britain's case, it was rather absurd to imagine that what we needed at that point was a revolution. So that began a sort of period of qualification of, of what my original beliefs might have been. Um, it was reinforced, although it, as a result of writing Outcast London, I got committed, commissioned by a publisher to do a Life of Engels. So that's partly why I carried on. Um, and that's the point, too, where I really uh, started engaging with the original sources um, and spoke in Germany, learned German properly, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, and, uh, what did, and that, by the way, came to a stop when my German was good enough to read Gustav Meyer um, and reading two volumes of that. Just made the biographer read. of Engels. Yes, 1,600 pages were. The poor guy wrote the first volume in 1918, the second volume in 1933, so it was very uh, bad luck in terms of its reception. But it's a great book. And I, I felt, God, what, what's, what am I doing? Doing this, repeating this. So that's when I really began to move away, away from this. Um, and at the same time, I got very interested in um, a debate we were having at the, at the same time in Cambridge. Um, uh, about linguistics and, and the, the re re relevance of language and so on. And that's the point where, from which things like language and class began. Uh, so what I'm left with still is obviously the sense in which uh, Marx provides a terrific window for understanding fundamental events in the 19th century. Um, he remains a great thinker. Uh, some of the things that I've just said you know, remain things we still need to think about, but I'm not a Marxist and I don't, and I think it, you know, a lot of Marxism is rather childish uh, representation of what's happening today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can agree with the last sentence, certainly. Um, <laughs> even your greatest critics, like Alex Kalinikos, uh, from the same university, I think, uh, concede that you make, I quote him, a thorough and competent job of showing the contexts the relatively liberal Rhineland, the counter-revolutionary Prussian regime of the 1830s and 40s, and the breakup of Hegel's philosophy in which Marx's own ideas germinated. You get good 
detailed accounts of example Paris in the lead up to 1848, the revolutions of that year, and the developments of the British working class movement and the European radical politics that made the first international possible. So that's a compliment from an enemy, so that is uh, very serious. But the question is, of course, how, uh, when we see the context which you describe so brilliantly, how to situate Marx's acting and thinking in these developing contexts. And on Marx and the revolutions of 1848-49, you write, I quote, uh, page 306, historians have come to understand class no longer as the expression of a simple socio-economic reality, but as a form of language discursively produced to create identity. Here we have this linguistic term. You say historians, but you do not mean all historians. You mean the Cambridge historians. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so this, uh, of course, reflects your uh, turn of the 80s. And it's precisely, of course, the study of language in the full sense that you rightly say historians have for a long time neglected, and in doing so, they have fallen victim to quite erroneous modes of uh, explanation. But uh, to what extent is this, for instance, applicable to Marx's notion of class? You've written a lot about languages of class, so that's why I'll ask it here. Uh, you argue, argue that Marx, uh, Marx's approach to class merged young Hegelian understandings of the role of labor in the transformation of the world with the language of class that originated in republican, socialist, and even legitimist opposition to the bourgeois monarchy of Louis Philippe in France. But my question is, does this not neglect the influence of French and British political economy on Marx's analysis of the class struggle? Um, already in his Kreuznach notebooks, it's a very early uh, notebooks, uh, he reflected on the influence of property relations during the French Revolution. And very important for Marx and Engels was the trip they made in Manchester, to Manchester in 1845. Engels was just starting there as a, a manager, let's say. It was extremely important because in Manchester, Marx met chartists and trade union leaders and read in the original the works of British political economists, including socialists like Thomas Rao Edmonds, William Thompson, John Francis Bray, uh, who used Ricardo's value theory to trace the roots of profit in the only apparently free, apparently free transaction between capital and the labor. We published all this in the media. Up section 2, <coughs> volumes 4 and 5, in case you're interested. Uh, these sources seem to contradict your argument that Marx, as you say, I quote you, failed to listen to the discourse of workers themselves. What do you say? Um. Well, I think his reading of what was going on was heavily um, influenced at that time by Engels, who after all had the knowledge about mm -hmm. what was going on uh, in Britain. And my more general argument is that what we, what, as it were, a Marxist argument is presented, and at its most sophisticated, say, with Eric Hobsbawm, uh, as the effect of two revolutions, the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, uh, what I wanted to say is that really most of this language is the product of a context in which uh, workers are excluded from the new constitution. You've got to see that the whole period between 1770s and 1840s, Saturn Zeit or whatever, uh, is one in which people have to rethink what the political basis of legitimacy and participation are. Uh, and in the course of that, um, you do get the d development of um, a cooperative movement, of um, a desire for uh, the representation and inclusion of workers. Um, and the, what happens is that they are explicitly excluded because of the memories of the terror and all sorts of fears that what workers will do. Uh, Marx, I think, is, it, it's true, he read a few texts in Manchester, uh, but I don't think he ever really had any strong first-hand familiarity with the opinions, no, the I agree opinions with that. of work. Um, so I think, in that sense, it's a very um, partial uh, knowledge of what was going on. Yeah, most of it he got from Engels, of course, who was really sitting in the Thorsal room. Thorsal room was a, a room where... Uh, Fighters were yes. wound up and so on. And one other thing to mention is that, of course, Engels thought um, 
the, the key demands of the workers which were to be included, that's what Chartism was about, to be enfranchised, to become part of the polity. That was insignificant compared with um, the opposition between capital and labour. Um, and so he thought the, the political side of, of Chartism was a sort of, uh, well not an uh, a superficial um, covering of what the real demands were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have Which proved absolutely wrong, by the way. Yeah. Marx and Engels is another topic which immediately connects to this, of course. Um, uh, as you show in the book, and uh, convincingly, is that, well, Engels wrote in 1844, Umrisse and Ökonomie, a short text uh, which laid the foundation, let's say, for the critique of political economy. And uh, Marx at that time did know anything about uh, political economy as he himself said. So the foundation of the theory comes from Engels and Marx then started studying this and then of course uh, became a master in this uh, field. So that is, so in that sense Engels was an inspiration for, for uh, Marx. He was that in several other respects perhaps. Um, and later he started writing things that uh, when he got the time to, to, to publish, let's say from uh, when he returned, came to London in uh, 1870 roughly, 69, uh, that um, he began to publish things that we can assume were not always uh, in full accordance with what Marx thought. For instance, uh, the anti during uh, that Engels published in 1878, it is doubtful whether Marx really could subscribe to everything that the dialectic of nature, the dialectic of nature that uh, Engels did not publish, but was published later in the Soviet Union. Uh, but these were notes uh, which also go in a direction which is, according to many, George Lukács, Alfred Schmidt, and many others, uh, was not really Marx. Um, so how would you, uh, if you were to, Give a brief outline of the relationship between Marx and Engels. How would you see their collaboration? Um, well, I think you've already said the first bit. I mean, Marx owes a tremendous amount to, to the original perception that Engels has of the situation in, in England, and that becomes a paradigm for uh, what he thinks class relations are about elsewhere. Um, he also focuses on, um, on political economy. The thing that I also well, um, mentioned in my little introductory thing is that um, when I talked about other socialists thinking man is a natural being and so on and so on, um, this was very much, I think, Engels' belief in, uh, in, in the 1840s and afterwards. Um, he attended the Rock overnight um, gatherings on a Sunday. He said he believed, he agreed with them in every respect, more or less. Uh, but what he did also was to link it up with Proudhon's idea of um, what is property, property is theft, which is a slight misunderstanding of what Proudhon meant, but nevertheless, um, putting these two things together um, is partly how it could be said that the proletariat were against private property per se. Um, so anyway, he owes an awful lot at this beginning, although I see, I think there's also um, a clear distinction once you look for it in what Marx is saying, what Engels is saying. I think Engels is a very superficial reading, reader of Hegel as opposed to Owen, um, and that comes through. So the whole idea of the, the uh, innovative nature of ideas and so on is not really strongly there in Engels. This is a difficult point to make because obviously there are nuances either way and I wouldn't want to say that Engels stops making points which Marx finds enlightening. However, I do think that um, uh, a lot of the, the, the theory that Marx develops in the 1850s and so on owes very little to Engels. Um, Engels only has a, 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 a marginal input However, quite important, because when 
when Marx runs out of money, he has to go to Manchester and stay with Engels for the weekend or something. And incidentally, uh, that's when he writes his preface to the Critique of Political Economy in 1959, which is very often in a Marxist canon treated as, you know, the absolute statement of what historical materialism is about. I suspect it had a lot to do with Marx, uh, Engels being, uh, as it were, the other side of the table when he was writing it. Um, and later on, of course, this thing is, is um, reinforced because uh, after the mid-60s, Marx has no other sources of income. Um, the bequests have run out. He can't do journalism anymore in, in a way that he had been able to in the 1850s. And so he is dependent on uh, Engels' goodwill. Um, and Engels um, uh, um, has developed more and more this idea of, of um, the natural being and, and connect the original Owenite insights with Darwin and so on and sees a parallel between what Marx is doing in, in history and what um, uh, Darwin has done in nature. Um, and I think Marx, um, well, he had to be a bit diplomatic, I think. Um, and also, of course, probably like others, he, he was happy that you know Darwin had not down the pilasters of Orthodox Christianity and the Victorians were feeling very uncomfortable about it. But he didn't, unlike Engels, think that he agreed with Darwin in the end. Uh, he, um, he thought, well, Darwin was very uninterested in human history. Also, Marx showed quite an uh, affection for um, uh, non-Darwinist theories um, and um, fixity of, 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 of types, which, you know, doesn't really go down with the Darwinian orthodoxy very much. I think in the long run, what matters too is that Marx pursued the idea that um, humanity was, was fine. You know, in the original Ur history of um, hunting and gathering and so on, uh, there was no real scarcity, there were resources uh, out outpacing sort of human desires. Therefore, you didn't need to have class, you didn't need to have justice, you didn't need to have a state and so on. They, they developed with scarcity. But the promise of the Industrial Revolution was at last maybe you'd overcome scarcity and you'd have that situation again. So that's why Marx in the last decade gets very interested, but always has been a bit, in uh, primitive human history because he thinks this is actually going to give us a clue about what post-capitalist history will look like, you know, in which uh, human nature is restored, no longer, as it were, uh, alienated or bifurcated in the way that private property, etc., etc., had imposed on it. Um, but what happens, of course, is that um, the scholarship establishing that uh, German scholarship like that of von Mara and so on uh, is progressively um, and Henry May more generally this is progressively um, subverted in um, the 1870s and 80s um, Fustel de Coulange uh, in, after the Franco-Prussian War probably had no strong reason to be very affectionate towards the Germans and he took a delight in demolishing all this uh, theorising uh, and showing that it ha its historical inaccuracies. So that by the mid-80s, late 80s, this theory has really uh, had it. On the other hand, the idea of man as a natural being so on had a long life still to run. And so that's partly why uh, Engels triumphs, because I think Marx has less and less to say against it. Mm -hmm. But then when Marx died, uh, Engels well, he, he writes somewhere that he always played the played the second violin and marks the first one, and uh, the, the now he has to be the, the first violin. And he says, "Well, I am not the first violin, so there may be I may make not a, lots of mistakes." So I quote for you now. Uh, um, and he was then editing from Marx had for during the last twelve years or so of his life, he had uh, been working on many things, but he had also. 
already before he published volume one of Capital in 1867, had uh, amassed uh, huge piles of notes and, and fragments and so on. And uh, these have now all been published since 2013 in the Mega. And you can see what Engels used, what he didn't use, how he used it, that he wrote himself 40 pages uh, and so on to glue things together and so But uh, what would you say about the way in which Engels did this? Well, I mean, revealing all this is, is not least due to, to Marcel, and, 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 and I think it's a tremendous piece of intellectual labor um, because it can actually restore the difference between what comes out in the published form and what was originally there and the process of selection, quite uh, intense selection in certain cases, which, um, which took place. I think um, Engels, I think that he was in good faith thinking he was putting together what was intelligible and made sense yeah. to him in, in editing the volume. So I don't think there was any sort of intention to deceive. However, I think it does cumulatively create a rather different picture of uh, what Marx was actually thinking about in his notes than what he actually was thinking. Um, and um, uh, Engels also was you know, very impatient, I think, about the notes. Um, one of the Russians, I think, um, he gave most of the notes to him, just said, I don't want to read these. Um, because he couldn't really cope with it. Um, and he was um, very skeptical about the idea, for instance, um, Russian populist idea, Narodnik idea, about the viability of the Russian peasant commune and so on. Um, and he thought, he also had almost a law that something from a lower, more primitive mode of production couldn't possibly be an inspiration for a higher mode of production. Whereas the, the Russian idea with Chernyshevsky and so on was that uh, you could skip a stage, you could sort of, um, that the, the Russians could actually bypass capitalism in some way. What's interesting, of course, is that Marx, in his letters to Vera Sasevich, more or less thinks the same thing, yeah. um, but that text gets very much sat on in the succeeding 40 years. But I think the, um, we, we still, at least I'm still trying to absorb um, what the, um, what the 1861-67 notes look mm -hmm. like and how they might otherwise have been assembled than how they were. Yeah, yeah this, uh, what we had discovered is that uh, the enormous difference between Marx and Engels in mentality, let's say, so that Marx's motto was the omnibus dubitandum, you have to doubt everything, and he was doubting himself every day after the day he had written. So that's also why he did not make much progress partly. Uh, and he was, for instance, very dissatisfied with volume one of Capital after it had been published, and he wanted to rewrite it. And he thought that gave too much attention to England, there should be more on, this, on the United States, because that was the power of the future, and things like that. And, uh, but more important than that is that Engels seems to have streamlined Marx a lot. I'll give you one example. Some of you will know that there is a famous Marxian law the law of the tendential decline of the rate of profit. And uh, Marx, uh, at first thought, yes, that's how it works. In the long run, rate of profit declines. Then he thought, well, maybe there are countervailing forces. And yes, he found six countervailing <laughs> forces. And then he was, well, what is stronger, the one or the other? And uh, he was, so I was doubtful. And then Engels, in, in volume three of Capital, yeah. gives all this, and then he himself Engels, introduces this sentence, and therefore the rate of profit declines. Right. So, right. yeah, because the working class needed some clear message, not this uh, intellectual ambiguity, and so that. Uh, so, in that sense, I think also that Engels partly created a scientific, a, a more scientific yeah. Marx than uh, really was Marx. It's, uh, I, I would just add. I mean. Supposing Marx had been able to publish volume two in 1867-68, we'd have a very different picture of what Marx stood for. Yeah, yeah. And the later editions of Capital, the edition of Capital that we use if we read Capital, 
is a, a version that Marx has never seen. It's published right. after the death by uh, Engels. So yeah. there's a lot here to read. What I, and I like this intention of your book that you try to reconstruct the original Marx, and because it has, in many ways, it has been uh, a very distorted view of his. But this brings me to the question, why did Marx not finish Capital? Um, you argue in the book that Marx abandoned his critique of political economy because, and I quote you, he had not been able to sustain his original depiction of Capital as an organism whose continuous and unstoppable spiral of growth from conspicuous beginnings in antiquity to global supremacy would soon encounter worldwide collapse. Uh, but I would say that nowhere in Marx's writings of the 19th uh, period, let's say 1857, Grundriss until 67, Capital One, uh, nowhere does he claim that capitalism is heading towards economic breakdown. Uh, his in initially, Marx had a six book plan. At least he said that he had a six book plan. And also, people think that this was just a trick to uh, entice the publisher to publish the volume on capital. Uh, he would then think, oh, I'll come more volumes and build a big thing. Uh, but anyway, he had a six book plan, and uh, that would, volume one would be on capital, volume six would be on the world market and crises. And uh, now, crises, of course, are not the same as collapse. Marx actually wrote uh, permanent crises do not exist. Uh, Marx's fullest discussion in uh, Capital Volume 3 portrays a spiral movement in which the tendency of the rate of profit to fall interacts with financial busts and economic slums, thanks to which capital is destroyed and exploitation increased sufficiently to allow the engine of accumulation to resume. So uh, Marx's discussion of the tendency of the rate of profit uh, to fall uh, concludes in the original manuscript of 64, 65, uh, with the sentence, and this sentence was cut by Engels, hence crises. So, uh, Engels didn't like this. In any way, Engels didn't like the idea as Marx uh, thought. Marx thought that crises and credit belong closely together. And Marx, uh, Engels took them separately and made two separate chapters separated by another chapter uh, of this. Uh, but um, so um, the vicious circle, uh, Marx wrote, and also cut by Engels, of boom and bust will continue as long as capitalism exists. Now, one of your suggestions is that Marx supposedly abandoned his economic studies after the publication of Volume 1 in 1867 because he was unable to address the development of capitalism as a global system. Um, recent research, however, has shown that from the 1840s onwards, uh, Marx analyzed bourgeois society as a transnational nexus of relationships. So, refer to the publication of Lucia Pradella, Thomas Kuczynski, and so on. One of his main preoccupations in the 1870s was to ensure that capital was not simply a study of Victorian Britain. Uh, and in the French edition of volume one, which was the one in which he already changed a few things, he included more material on colonialism and the world market and so on. He tried to extend the analysis of crisis and financial markets to, as I said already, cover the United States and so on. Uh, so uh, given this perspective, this, it, let's say, increasing transnationalization of his analysis. Uh, how should we think about this Marxian interest in the Russian uh, of China, the, the land commune that you just mentioned? You devote a lot of attention in the last part of the book to this, and rightly so. It's very interesting what you have to say about this. Uh, but you consider Marx's interest in the Russian commune as, a, uh, as an indication that he was abandoning his economic studies. Uh, it would not make sense to assume that he sought to deepen his analysis, but no, would it not be, make sense, I say, to uh, assume that he sought to deepen his analysis of rent and landed property in volume three by studying American and Russian agriculture. He was, the United States was a big agricultural power. Russia was the other power he thought would come up. It was a great prediction, of course. Uh, and he wanted to understand both these societies. Would that be an equally plausible or even more plausible explanation? So that he did not give up his interest in political economy. 
Well, a lot of your correctives I would accept. Um, I think that um, I probably stated this a bit too strongly, but he gave up economic studies in the 70s. I mean, he makes various attempts to uh, start capital again. Uh, but my sense was that he, he, he gets frustrated, he stops, he, he, he then has another go a year or two later and so on. He does try to adapt, as you say, I mean, the French tradition of capital, um, so that it's not just a story about England and so on. Um, and uh, I, I'm very open to the idea that he, he tried to have a more transnational idea. Um, but I think there was, um, well, and optimistically, I'd also say that, you know, the 1867 or 1864 to 70 period was one where he thought he was back on track. Um, not the revolution of 1848, not 1789, but a way in which transition might be happening in, in front of one's eyes. I think he was very um, uh, disenchanted by what the way that all came to an end. Um, first of all, he thought, you know, because British trade unions lost interest in, in um, uh, the international movement um, after, after the Reform Bill, and they got more interested in supporting the Liberal government, not least because the Liberals were trying to do serious land reform in, in, in Ireland and so on. Um, first of all, he thought, well, Ireland is going to be the um, vulnerable point. Uh, and this is going to bring the system crashing down. But in fact, the, the Irish um, move towards a more constitutional opposition, um, and again, very much attached to the Liberal Party, which marks, if you had an anathema in British politics, at least the Liberals rather than anybody else. Um, and then, of course, later on, one of his uh, recurrent themes, of course, is his anti-Russian idea um, and um, a pro, mildly pro Ottoman sort of view of, of European development. So, Russia Turkish war, he thinks Russia's going to lose, that'd be great, revolution will come from the East and this sort of thing. Um, but of course, Russia is okay in that war, so that doesn't work either. So, I think um, he still, I think he still thinks, you know, and you can see it from what he says about. Um, Morgan and ancient society towards the end. He still thinks that capitalism is a transient uh, sure. form yeah. and it's going to be bypassed. But I think he's given up any idea about precisely when that is going to happen or whether it's going to happen in his lifetime. I think he's much more um, agnostic, if you like, about what will happen next uh, in a way that in the 1850s he, he hadn't been. This brings me to my last question, considering time. Um, well, I quoted your criticism of Werner Blumenberg in the early 1970s. Oh, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I wish it, uh, my question would be, be have you now become the new Blumenberg? <laughs> uh, you say Karl, because you call him Karl all the time. Uh, he was at its most uh, politically effective when he forged, as you say, a new social democratic language in the mid-1960s to his role in the First International and supposedly distance himself from his revolutionary communist youth. Marx was here in Amsterdam in on September 8, 1872. We all know this, of course. Uh, he gave a speech here and he said the following. It is a very important speech. He said, you know that the institutions, mores and traditions of various countries must be taken into consideration and we do not deny that there are countries, such as America, England, and if I were more familiar with your institutions, I would perhaps also add Holland, uh, where the workers can attain their goal by peaceful means. So he was not necessarily advocating a violent revolution. I said in some cases it is perhaps possible to have a peaceful transition. So that would be water on your mill. But then he continued, this being the case, we must also recognize the fact that in most countries on the continent, the lever of our revolution must be force. It is force to which we must someday appeal in order to erect the rule of labor. So that is another one. <laughs> so um, my question is indeed is, uh, how do you see this? I have heard 
so somebody told me that in an interview he said that now if Marx would live now he would be a Fabian, so to say a social democrat. Do you remember that you said that? Maybe you didn't say it, but it could well be, I think. So, well, what do you think as Blumenberg? Yes, uh, well, first of all, I, I feel retrospectively very apologetic to Blumenberg because uh, it was a, a sort of new left task in the 60s, which um, I don't take any pride in remembering because uh, I think Blumenberg's a jolly good book. Um, uh, in terms of social democracy, yes, I think that's. Um, the most sort of coherent analysis that he has in the 1860s about where politics was go going and in the inaugural address as I also argued I thought he did a lot to um, construct, compose create a social democratic language which was going to be of lasting use um, and of course we're all suffering now perhaps from the way in which that social democratic language isn't quite connected with any, anything anymore in the way that it did. But I think certainly from the 1870s through to the 1960s, it was a language which um, an emancipatory um, party could use, whether they were Fabian or slightly to the left, you know, but um, uh, I, I, I'm happy to uh, acknowledge that that's probably what I think now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I think this already gives us an impression. Uh, and now, do we have any questions, criticisms, uh, whatever? Uh, please feel free to take the floor. We still have about half an hour for discussion. <laughs> well, we've we had a drink. <laughs> and yes, you want drinks outside? No, then, after, uh, after the questions. First <laughs> 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 the questions. First the questions. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank both of you. A lot of uh, new knowledge. Uh, I, um, my question is basically related to um, 1857. You mentioned that didn't, the revolution didn't happen. Now, I always wondered about the work Marx has written about the 1857 Indian mutiny um, in India, that was in 1857, and he has written quite a lot on that. And I always was wondering why suddenly he was so interested in this Indian mutiny. And um, my question is, do you think that had to do with the fact that actually what he thought would happen in Europe didn't happen, but he saw something like a revolution happening, or he wanted to see it in that way. And that's why he got interested in um, I don't think that's the answer. Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, he, at that stage, he's still a supporter of British rule in India, uh, because he thinks they're a civilizing force, they're bringing roads and rail and all that, and, and, and civil service for that matter. Um, and he thinks the interesting comparison he makes is not this is the, um, the Indian version of 1789. He says this is the Indian version of 1787. 1787 was the revolt, the revolt of the notables um, who tried to push back, um, you know, a society of states and so on. And he thinks the people who are rebelling are a very sort of pampered uh, group and not of uh, <coughs> revolutionary significance. And the first person who makes him correct it in a way with the speech in Parliament is Disraeli, who says, we think this is probably a national revolt. Um, after that, Marx slightly changes his tune. But originally, he's pretty unsympathetic to the <coughs> This was the one and only question, was that? Yeah, so, ah, Jonathan. Jonathan, please. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, Gareth, I'd like to uh, raise an issue that we were discussing a bit over dinner, which is that, um, you know, here we are at the 200th birthday of Marx. There is a big Marx 
revival of a certain kind, especially uh, on the contemporary left. I mean, there are many other books coming out for Marx's birthday. Uh, the past three days, there's been a huge conference uh, in Cologne on uh, the, the what does Marx's political economy have to say to us uh, today. Now, the, the question is, for those people who would say that um, uh, Marx has never been so relevant in the wake of, let's say, the global financial crisis, the euro crisis, uh, and so on, and uh, in a way we see also, a, let's say, a revival of 1970s neo-Marxism, um, what would you say to, to them? First of all, um, where do you disagree uh, that um, Marx's concepts are uh, really useful to understand the, uh, the wake of the financial crises and economic crises we've experienced in the past uh, decade? And uh, to what extent um, is the, uh, the neo-Marxism that we're seeing today, what real relationship, if any, does it have to the Marx uh, the historical marks of the 19th century that you have been uncovering and telling us about tonight. Um, well, that's 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 a very interesting question. Um, I think the um, I mean, first of all, that um, you know what Marx his work stands for and still you know has uh, a legitimate point to it is that you know, capitalism is a very unstable um, and volatile force, that it is something which, as it were, uh, or the value form or whatever, has overcome all political barriers and so on. So in some way, uh, we are living, just as he was living, with the sense of a world market, with uh, financial um, instability, uh, with boom and slump and all these sorts of things which are, I mean, he's not the only person in the 1840s, 1870s to remark upon uh, these things, but he was one of the uh, most informed observers of it because he read The Economist every week and he sort of tried to follow the thing event by event. Um, so his writings, I think, still have uh, interesting um, resonances uh, really now. I don't think, um, however, that uh, beyond that, um, uh, Marx has anything very specific to tell us about the present crisis, if that's what it is. Um, I think, um, and also, the quality of the reading of these people, um, uh, very often I think is very cavalier. I mean, it's... Um, uh, that it's a metaphorical Marx, as you said, I think, in the early dinner, or a rhetorical Marx, rather than, you know, did he actually, in analytic terms, produce something which we can compare with what's happening now? Uh, there's more of it in some of the literature. I mean, Piketty makes some attempt at that, I suppose. Um, but I'm... Uh, what presses me slightly is the way in which he becomes this uh, just this ba banner um, and a way to excommunicate and anathematize many other ways of thinking about things without himself being uh, a very sort of uh, thorough mode of, of, of study and criticism either. So he's just someone who, who can be used as a little club to knock down, you know, in, in, in England, for instance, I mean, all that's necessary is to be told you're a Blairite, and that you know, just ends the debate. Very done, yeah. um, and th this is very crude forms of political debate. And I think, in that sense, I don't think Marx is at the centre of it, actually, but he is he's one of the people who can be used against the, um, uh, the, re the reformist and sort of... Um, Capitalist friendly reforms of so called social democracy in, in, in recent years, I think. <coughs> Maybe I can add one thing here. I am co editor of uh, 
uh, the historical materialism book series published by Brill. It's, it's, uh, okay. uh, and that tries to revive the Marx studies. Uh, and we are now approaching volume 160. <coughs> it's since 2002. <laughs> and we have 200 books under contract. <laughs> well, uh, there's something going on there. There is something going on, and these, I can assure you, are very serious books uh, uh, also. So uh, you are right, of course, of, of it marks being used as a club and so, but there's also another kind of, of serious study of marks going on and, and reviving. The gentleman there is. I heard in uh, Deutschland Funk that um, the People Republic of China is going to spend a statue to the city of a tree. They did. They, they, did. they did. But my question is as follows. What's the political significance of this gift? The <laughs> <laughs> famous well, sinologist here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on the one hand, it must be a terrific embarrassment for them. Uh, because if you just gave him a, gave him a statue, fine. But a statue 30 foot high is, is something else, I think, and probably not what most people would want to see, particularly in a rather Catholic, conservative town like Trier. On the other hand, of course, like every uh, historic city, they depend on tourism. And I can tell you from uh, my own experience of Cambridge, Cambridge in the summer is a Chinese city. Um, and um, I, I don't say it with any mouth, I mean, Totally good, but um, a lot of European towns now depend, I think, on on the new Chinese wealth of the Chinese middle class and so on, and their spending power. Um, so I think, you know, while whereas they might feel a bit snooty at one level, they're probably jolly grateful at another. But did you mean with your question also what the Chinese intention is, or is it only how the, the German? No, no, the Chinese. Yeah. So as sinologists, you have to answer that. That I'm <laughs> less certain about. Um, because, well, I mean, they, they, um, they're, very, they're still in the 1950s in terms of studies of Marx. Um, and um, I've been contacted even by um, senior university people in China saying that we've got this dreadful course, introductory course, which everyone has to do, because of Marxism, Leninism, of course, Maoism, of course. Um, is there a tactful way in which we can reform the syllabus and make it a bit more interesting? Uh, so, of course, there are things happening in China beneath the surface, which I think are very interesting, and I think, well, my hope is, but also, I think, reasonably based, that sooner or later, this thing is going to sort of blow up and um, there's going to be, and it may end up, of course, tragically with another Tiananmen Square, but I mean, it's, the, the forces are building up. Once you give people much more education, uh, they, there's the internet, they can't stop it beyond a certain point and all that. Um, I think this will actually um, result in more plural, plurality of thought and um, eventually more dissidents. How they'll deal with it, of course, another thing. But I think in that sense, of course, once they do start reading Marx in a different way, they, they can start criticizing their own government. But uh, they study Marx intensely. That is, I mean, apart from all these uh, yeah, yeah. rubbish courses, is a, the faculties who study uh, Marx, uh, thousands of people, and they translate the mega into Chinese. Um, oh, every volume. Oh, so, really? really? Yeah, yeah, that. sure. Uh, sure. and, but the question is then, uh, how uh, do they see Marx? My impression is uh, they are mainly interested in the philosophical Marx who talks about alienation and so on. As soon as Marx talks about critique of political economy and capitalism, they don't, they, they don't want to know this because it too, right. comes too close for comfort, let's say. Right. So, so question? Yes, please. There's, there's still time. Sure, there's lots of time. A bit different question. I mean, we've been around theory and economy and stuff like that, but you dealt with them quite a lot. Um, did you develop a personal relationship to Marx? Did you discover something special 
about the person of him? Do you like him? Do you dislike him? Uh, dream I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to answer, <laughs> but I think it's interesting dealing so much with him, making such a book. Um, yes, although um, I mean, as, as a human being, I sort of found myself um, probably solidarizing a bit more with his father and mother um, <laughs> and, um, and his wife. And, um, I mean, in other words, I think he was a very self-centered person with a very high sense of entitlement. Um, he, he, he had a nice side, he, sort of, um, he, he loved his children, etc. Although rather sort of, um, in, a, in a quite domineering way in some set, set instances. Um, and um, so, and he also had a sort of, um, because of this sense of entitlement, or leadership, or whatever it was, um, he could be very authoritarian. He could be very brusque with opponents, be very thin-skinned. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of things which I don't like him, about him very much, and I, um, I, I hope I've brought out some of these sides. Um, but at the same time, th you know, there are other sides which you know, it's not totally bad in any sense. Um, um, well, that, that sounds too crude, doesn't it? Like, what I'm trying to say is that there is, there is a slightly more generous side to him, but very often you have to look for it. countermanded by these other tendencies. Okay. Okay. Is it true that, uh, true that he said, I'm not a Marxist? Yes, uh, uh, oh my God. Uh, uh, when, when, uh, it's too strong, I'm sorry. When did he, did he say it, and when did he say it, why did he say it? That he's not a Marxist. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. Um, apparently he said, I'm not a Marxist. Is that well, true? Yeah, yes, but it was to, in France, a group around Paul the Thard, um, I think I might be saying, in the late 70s, developed sort of ideas which were very crude. Um, and I think in, in exasperation, Marx said, look, if, if this is Marxism, then I'm not a Marxist. Oh, so I don't think it was meant to have a more general meaning than that. No. We didn't know yet what was going to come. No. <laughs> no. Thank you. after the financial crisis and with staggering levels of inequality, I think he does have some relevance for us. Um, and I would like also, I mean, the is economical, is economical analysis and it's used by economists like Michael Roberts in, the, in England and uh, Richard Wolff in the United States. And they are really, um, well, productively uh, um, uh, making use of, um, well, Speak in the mic. Speak in the mic. Yeah, it's thought. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there maybe there is some relevance after all, um, even 200 years after this push. Mark Roberts, um, great website. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, would you like to say something? Well, only very briefly, I'd say that I haven't read all the uh, writings of people who are taking Mark seriously, the present, present. So there may well be people who I ought to read more carefully, but uh, on the basis of what I have read, I haven't been that impressed so far. Okay. No, 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 first Marwan. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit like a follow-up, um, because um, of course you're doing an intellectual history, and I think it's very valuable also with the, like the mega project that we can really see the origins of you know, how those thoughts were uh, evolving. But as historians, uh, we, we know that we can't also put our you know, feet in, in our actors' uh, shoes, so we can't really be sure that you know, what, what were the motivations and what were the things. So it, sometimes this kind of discussion reminds me of this discussion of what is real Islam or what is real Christianity, you know? Because it's like a, a little bit relevant to what, what he said now. Because it is lived. People have like read it and people have perceived it in different ways. And I think what Marcel was emphasizing, so like your trajectory, 
and, um, and, and historical experience, of course, have shown us maybe some crude forms of it, some childish forms of it, but they were not the only ones. There were the, there were the, you know, the narratives that were powerful and you know, that they could exist. Uh, but I think it's very important to see how people, it's not a question, sorry, but it's like how people perceived it and how people read it as, you know, like the historical materialism method. So for a lot of Marxists today, these are, you know, these insights are important. The way he approached in inequality, uh, the way he approached his uh, study material. So um, as I link with the real Islam thing, so you can't really think about Islam without thinking what Muslims are doing today, you know, so it's like, we, we can't really break this link. <coughs> well, Eric, have you thoughts? Yeah. Only just to say that, um, I mean, of course you're right. I mean, that um, there are insights which intelligent readers can pick up from reading Marx, particularly <coughs> if they're trying to relate it to current um, crises and developments and so on. Um, and that's really, I would have thought, um, possible with other thinkers too that you know, people can get inspiration from it. How much I mean what I was trying to do in the book was you know much more simple I was just trying to say what was Marx when you cleared all the subsequent development away um, in some ways of course it's an unrealistic project but it's worth trying nevertheless I think uh, in order to sometimes it gets nearer to what his intended meaning was uh, than you know, just picking out sentences or citations and thinking of them as as insights, irrespective of the circumstances in which they were written. Okay, now I have one more. Jonathan, you wanted yeah, to? I yeah, but wait, 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 wait one sec. Wait one second. Yeah. I wanted to say, uh, if there are no, this could be the last question, unless there is somebody who still has a question now, then he or she should tell me now. So after Jonathan, we have solved all the problems. <laughs> mm. well, I, this is just a kind of uh, coda to some of the exchanges about Mar Marx and Marxism today. Um, so it's about Marx and Piketty. And I think many of us, many people would agree that among the um, contemporary analysts who claim to take inspiration from Marx, uh, Piketty has been among the most influential and is also in some respects, especially as a historian, among the most serious. Uh, but listening to your exchange about the um, tendency of the rate of profit to fall, uh, I was struck by a paradox because for Piketty, in his at least uh, model, the great problem that causes inequality is the tendency of the rate of profit not to fall and for the rate of growth to lag behind uh, the, uh, the rate of profit, which somehow, for reasons we don't understand, remains historically stable over long periods. So what should we make about the relationship between Marx and Piketty uh, if the debate about the, rate, the tendency of the rate of profit uh, to fall and countervailing tendencies is at least a central feature of what came to be known as Marxist political economy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Marcel gave a good analysis of what, which you can get by looking at the original um, Marx notes compared with uh, Engels' transcription in Volume Three of the, um, the of what Marx thought about the tendency of of, of the rate of profit to fall uh, and the way in which he ended up thinking it was a very complex uh, problem in which you know there was no just simple answer, having originally thought that, you know, this was going to be it. Um, and so uh, I think on that basis, um, other projections can also be made. So I, I don't really get into any judgment on whether Piketty was legitimately making a point or not. I mean, the fact is that whole generations of Marxists did try to make the rate of profit falling you know, a sort of... Um, uh, a sort of doom bell for capitalism, and it never happened. So, you know, um, I don't know whether the rate remaining is also a dangerous thing, uh, as you say, or Piketty says. Yeah, I can only add that Piketty has two Trotskyist parents. <laughs>
So then, I thank you all for listening to us here and having uh, taken part in the discussion. And thank Helga, you would like? Yes, thank you, Marcel and Gareth, uh, for being here and uh, this uh, fantastic discussion. And you're all invited for a drink in the cafeteria, also bottle, espanade. Thank you very much, Gareth.